All right. Well, thank you guys for joining the CIS webinar. This is Rebecca Marsh, and I'm an associate professor at Cincinnati Children's, and I'm going to serve as senior moderator for the first case. But I'm really hoping I'm not going to speak much. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ryan Nelson, who's at his first year at Boston Children's Hospital, who's going to prevent, present a very interesting case with Kelly Williams, who is an assistant professor down at MUSC. So Ryan, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so I would uh, like to present a case to you guys today um, entitled uh, Undetectable Trex in a Patient with a Primary Neutrophil Defect. So um, this case begins with um, a newborn that we heard about through um, uh, our newborn screening um, at, uh, in the state of Massachusetts, um, which uh, is a baby that was born at 32 weeks and four days um, at an outside hospital in, in Massachusetts. Um, their history uh, was that uh, they had some RDS requiring CPAP initially at birth um, and underwent a sepsis evaluation um, soon after, which was negative um, and had a 48-hour course of empiric antibiotic coverage for that. Um, the results from the newborn screening lab were that the tracks for this baby um, were undetectable. Um, which we oftentimes hear about, um, particularly in um, premature infants, but um, uh, we oftentimes hear about uh, treks that are low or less than 252, um, but less commonly uh, undetectable, particularly um, when, when newborns aren't uh, extremely premature. But um, so what we uh, requested was that the um, outside hospital sent um, flow cytometry, um, and the initial lymphocyte subsets came back as such. Um, so just to kind of uh, highlight your attention to the, the values in red, so um, uh, we had a T-cell lymphopenia with 55 cells per microliter um, on a scale where we're typically looking for a greater than 2,500. Um, we also saw low NK cells and low B cells um, at 83 and 12, respectively. Uh, and then importantly, um, very low percentages of naive cells in both the CD4 and CD8 compartments. Um, so uh, we, you know, less typically for um, premature infants do we have results that look like this if the, if the abnormal newborn screen was secondary to uh, prematurity. Um, and so this made us um, really start to think about uh, is this, uh, could this be characterized as T minus B minus NK minus skid? Um, Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. So, <laughs> so uh, some one of the next um, uh, set of testing uh, that we requested while the patient was still at an outside facility um, was ADA and PNP um, testing, uh, given this relative phenotype, uh, both of which returned normal. Uh, the PHA um, uh, proliferation uh, was low, but not absent at 63,000, where we're typically uh, normal being uh, greater than 96,000. Um, and uh, typically in, in um, SCID, we, we would see a, a lower number. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, this, is, this is soon after birth, but the uh, IgG was uh, appropriate, um, still well within the window of maternal transfer of immunoglobulins. Uh, but very low IgA and IgM uh, undetectable. Um, <clears throat> so to jump ahead, this uh, patient, um, following these results, they were transferred uh, over to Boston Children's and they were in our NICU um, and uh, were initially started um, uh, or later on, a little bit later on in their course, eventually started on IVIG, uh, 0.5 grams per kilo, Q3 weeks, uh, and then prophylaxis, um, uh, with atovacone for uh, PJP and fluconazole for antifungal. Um, and their hospital course with us, um, initially uh, the baby came over on uh, a little bit of O2 supplementation, which was uh, you know, thought by our NICU to be uh, well within normal limits for uh, an infant of their age and prematurity. Um, and the overall relatively expected course. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, we sent um, a number of viral studies given the concern for SCID and um, EBV was the one that came back positive with a very low copy number of 1,000 copies per microliter and subsequently um, was undetectable. Um, uh, around between three and four weeks of life, um, the uh, infant did have um, uh, an event with some uh, apnea and bradycardia. Um, and uh, around the same time, it was noted that um, uh, the baby had uh, a couple of ulcerations in the in the inguinal region, um, and also some <coughs> umbilical stump. Um, uh, had a full sepsis evaluation, was on broad spectrum antibiotics, but ultimately found to be uh, uh, positive for E. coli bacteremia, and then uh, uh, ultimately had a treatment course narrowed to cefotaxime. Ryan, I'm going to stop you real quick. I just want to yeah. see if anybody wants to throw out some ideas for a differential before we go too much further, just based on the clinical presentation and what we know now. Anybody have suggestions or what they would be worried about? If so, you can put them in the attendee chat. Was the trek repeated? Is what Carl's wondering. Yeah, I, I, uh, the re the trek was repeated and was abnormal. So at this point, we did have a conversation with the family, and you know, really upon arrival prior prior to this history, but um, and told them that we thought that the the diagnosis of skid was likely. Um, I mentioned kind of the a couple of things on the T minus B minus and T minus differential, but which would be normal, reassuringly. Um, but, you know, the, none, of, none of those populations were completely absent, and so, you know, that classification isn't always um, you know, completely indicative of, of the long etiology, but if anyone has any other thoughts? <clears throat> Okay, I guess we will go on. Okay. Um, so I believe here is our, here's where we thought we had an answer. So um, what came back positive um, was. The question would be if congenital EBV could whack out the lymphocyte numbers is what um, Carl was wondering. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I I think I wouldn't have suspected um, uh, such a profound uh, T cell and NK cell lymphopenia with the the EBV infection, um, but me more concerned about affecting B cells. I might expect that the NK cells would be be higher in that setting potentially, um, or and, and T cells for that matter. Um, but I'm I'm not aware of I haven't encountered that circumstance. Okay. And I would uh, say the EBV number is relatively small too, so it's yeah, it was not very necessarily low. concerning. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We did have a conversation, um, uh, you know, uh, with the mother about breastfeeding in this setting. Um, we suspected that it was potentially transmitted through breast milk. Um, uh, and and ultimately, in a conversation with the families, they they elected to. To discontinuing breast breastfeeding, uh, partially out of some of these concerns, I think. Um, so, um, uh, as we can see here, there's a number of uh, hits that came up, um, as is typically the case uh, when we send large panels for uh, primary immune deficiencies. Um, the one at the top was. Um, uh, caught our eye uh, just uh, in the report, as you see here, as as uh, classification as a pathogenic variant, um, uh, and uh, kind of the remaining um, genes that you can, and that's in RAC2, um, the remaining genes, uh, ACV, um, uh, involved in uh, telomerase recruitment, and CARD14 is kind of in the NF-kappa-B pathway. Um, FAS, uh, you know, kind of in the ALPS pathway, IL-21, 
itch and PGM3 are all uh, heterozygous mutations. Um, well, they all are, but um, we're all uh, listed as uh, VUS status and and um, all thought to be um, inherited inherited through a um, autosomal recessive pattern. Um, however, uh, advance here, RAC2 um, uh, did uh, show a, a substitution of an aspartic acid for an asparagine at um, position 57, um, which uh, was has previously been described um, and has been associated with an autosomal dominant form of uh, neutrophil uh, immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, interestingly, I think that the, the the first case of this was was also picked up on a newborn screen, um, uh, and with an identical mutation, and um, and so uh, based upon this result, we thought that this was likely the the um, relevant mutation for this patient, and and um, uh, there was likely an underlying neutrophil immunodeficiency. Um, but as I mentioned, um, you know, this, this mutation had previously been identified on a newborn screen, which is, of course, screening for SCID and screening for T-cell development, um, uh, which um, is, is part of, I think, uh, what made us interested in this, or, you know, made us find this case particularly interesting. Um, subsequent parental testing, I should say, confirmed that this was a de novo mutation. Um, and so looking at a little bit of that literature, um, uh, with a couple of uh, um, papers here just shown uh, particular, specifically describing patients with um, the same um, D57N um, heterozygous mutation and, and uh, autosomal dominant um, pattern of inheritance, um, uh, they found a number of different uh, defects, both in, in sort of the neutrophil um, side of things and in, in lymphocytes. And so uh, shown on the left, just kind of um, addressing some of the early work, um, they identified um, defects in neutrophil migration um, in panel A in a chemotaxis assay in response to FMLP and IL-8 <laughs> uh, compared to controls. And then panel B, they also found defects in phagocytosis of IgG-coated red blood cells. Um, again, in response to the stimulus of FMLP, um, uh, defect in impaired neutrophil rolling um, on uh, L-selectin and glycam-1, uh, impaired neutrophil adhesion in, in panel D, um, uh, um, uh, in res our, uh, adhesion to a fibrinogen in that assay, and then also in, in uh, impaired superoxide generation before and after um, um, uh, stimulation, or excuse me, in response to stimulation with FMLP. Um, so, um, and, and I do, I, I um, did write there before and after stem cell transplantation, but kind of looking back a little bit closer into this data, I think, you know, really the, the best comparisons are made within each of the, the, um, groups of columns there. And so I'm not sure it's really a fair comparison, um, uh, of comparing the um, pre and post BMT uh, between the control and the, the D57N mutation. Um, but kind of the summary of, of this data is that there's this uh, phenotype of uh, defect in neutrophil function um, that kind of uh, resembles features of both LAD and um, uh, uh, CGD, um, which is kind of uh, fitting with the the clinical phenotype that we saw in this patient with the, the skin lesions that ultimately um, uh, identified um, uh, bacterial uh, or bacteremia and uh, bacterial infection. Um, when uh, some of the studies that have looked at lymphocyte function have actually shown um, um, uh, some some defects in the lymphocyte uh, lymphocytes as well, um, and actually um, I think the top panel uh, uh, is is showing actually calcium flux. I meant for this to be actually a CFSC dilution assay, but um, suffice to say that in in this uh, other patient with the same described mutation, they found um, normal uh, calcium flux in response to TCR stimulation as well as um, in response uh, CFSC dilution. Um, or proliferation. 
um, in their assays. Uh, but they did find defects um, uh, in integrin-dependent aggregations. And if you show, or if you just look at the um, uh, patient as compared to the control, there's kind of this disorganization of the the um, lymphocytes, um, and they don't really uh, form these uh, aggregates um, in response to stimulation. Um, so really our next step um, was to look at neutrophil function, and the first assay that we sent was just a DHR. Um, now our DHR uh, in, our, in, our, in house um, is just in response to PMA, and actually we found uh, no differences between the patient and control, um, suggesting normal neutrophil burst. But um, again, this is in response to the one um, stimulus. And uh, previous, at least the data that I showed you, um, showed um, um, neutrophil function in response to other stimuli, suggesting that that the defect in RAC2 function um, is is kind of a signaling defect that that doesn't is independent of PMA, um, and uh, but is depend or uh, is affected by FMLP stimulation, and, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit um, down the way, but. Um, that was previously described. So this result was not completely unexpected um, uh, when we ran it on our patient. Um, so really, we uh, followed her closely over time and uh, you know tracked her lymphocyte um, population uh, over, you know from two, four, and six and eight weeks, and really up until the time of discharge. And uh, really, you know her her phenotype stayed pretty constant. So um, she, she maintained a, a T cell lymphopenia, um, really only going up to um, 244 cells per microliter by um, two months of life. Uh, her um, NK cells did normalize, um, uh, were initially elevated. I think, again, this may have been in response to the, the EBV infection, um, but then ultimately um, went up to a normal level in the uh, B cells remained uh, affected as well, and so uh, still uh, has a relative B cell lymphopenia over the course of the stay, and and it continues to have um, low levels of of naive percentages, suggesting uh, low um, thymic output um, or small, uh, uh, you know, essentially a, still maintain the T cell uh, lymphopenia phenotype. Um, but reassuringly, uh, repeat PHA uh, um, around two months of age uh, had normalized, and that's kind of, again, consistent with uh, the previous data that I showed you in other reported patients. And so um, I think um, on the one hand, uh, this patient um, uh, really has the, the clinical phenotype that's kind of consistent with the neutrophil defect, um, but then, uh, you know, the laboratory phenotype actually, uh, I think uh, the patient had a little bit more of a severe T cell deficiency ultimately, but good T cell function. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, it wasn't at this point, but prior uh, that we uh, consulted our BMT team for evaluation for bone marrow transplant, um, just in the initial uh, setting of uh, consideration of severe combined immune deficiency. Um, uh, uh, who became involved um, and uh, worked this patient up. Um, ultimately, their course, you know, we, we continued her on IVIG, um, uh, prophylaxis uh, um, for uh, low IgG. Um, we uh, transitioned ultimately once the um, patient was old enough uh, from um, uh, tovacone prophylaxis to Bactrim prophylaxis and, and provide a little bit um, better um, uh, skin coverage for, for bacterial infections in, in addition to the um, PJP prophylaxis that, um, you know, she may or may not need at this point with the, the, nor the reassuring proliferations, but still T-cell lymphopenia. Um, and then ultimately, um, the family was discharged home to South Carolina because one piece I didn't mention on kind of complicating the family circumstances is that the baby was born outside of state while visiting family. Um, and uh, they um, uh, ultimately um, 
wanted to move closer to home for, for ongoing care. And so it's at this point that we uh, reached out to Dr. Williams at the Medical University of South Carolina, um, whom has been um, taking care of this patient. Thank you, Ryan, for um, the detailed presentation from early on at Boston. Um, I was happy to accept this interesting patient. Um, oh, no, I can't move the slide. Maybe, can you move it? Yep. Yep, thank you. Okay, so this is one busier slide, but kind of summarizes what how I've inherited her, which is for been about, about a month. Um, but parents are pretty... Um, they definitely want to be home for a lot of the transplant stuff. And they really were just, they went up there, I think for a funeral um, or not a funeral, but her grandfather was passing away. So I think they wanted to see him beforehand and then she went to preterm labor. Um, so it was a much more prolonged stay than she was, they were envisioning. Um, but so her amino phenotype from a lab standpoint from the TB and NK cells is pretty much similar. Um, her last CD4 count was around 250. Um, it was interesting though, I think for me when I inherited her, because we haven't, as we've been talking about neutrophil function, um, Ryan didn't really show much of her neutrophil numbers and everything was pretty normal. Um, mm -hmm. um, up at, uh, yeah, yeah. so she had no evidence of any neutro neutropenia at all. Um, which I know, um, uh, well is often described, um, and by often, I mean, in the few cases has also been reported. Um, and when I met her, I am, she had significant neutro, uh, severe, uh, neutropenia and, um, everything else was otherwise pretty similar. And so when I talked about it with mom, she was like, oh no, nobody's ever mentioned anything like that. Um, and so, you know, it was really unclear to me, um, if she just waited to move home to declare herself or if there could be other factors. And so um, they did tr um, transition her to back to him just like a, the day before discharge or a few days before discharge, I think um, is what it looks like. And so I saw her about six days after discharge from, so about a week after or so after she started back to him. And I, you know, it's always something that you have to think about. Um, but also in the patient who we know is at, um, it, this could be just part of her progression of disease. Um, but her white cell count was obviously always low, but her uh, neutrophils have never really um, been great. And now I just checked them again and they're back down to like 400. Um, from a clinical standpoint though, like her umbilical cord is looking much better. Um, and so um, I've just been kind of managing her from a, she, from, she has not had any infections, um, and I'm continuing her on IVIG, but we're in the process of switching her to sub Q, um, mainly cause I want to keep her out of the hospital as much as possible. Um, even the, the, um, infusion suite. Um, and then she had a consult with our BMT team as well, or, um, so I did repeat, um, her DHR. Oh, sorry. Was there ever a bone marrow biopsy? Um, not here and not up there, no. So the neutropenia, there has not been a bone marrow biopsy to date. Um, so I did repeat her DHR here specifically with F, um, FMLP stimulations. Um, Brian already mentioned, you know, the DHR they did with PMA um, showing that she had normal neutrophil oxidative burst when stimulated with PMA, but, um, clearly here, her FMLP was, um, decreased showing abnormal response, um, um, because of this activation or lack thereof of the neutrophils. Um, and so she has, uh, the defective oxidative burst FMLP PMA, and this confirmed that, um, both her, and this is, this was all done at Mayo. Um, so functionally confirmed her mutation, which already was described to be pathogenic. So, um, sorry. Um, so this kind of where we're at now, um, you know, they're following with me and our transplant team. Um, it was interesting because I know that, um, I guess, uh, they had discussions about transplant initially at Boston and Ryan, you can chime in, but from most of this, I've heard from maternal report, but you know, and immediately when everything was in the skid phase, they were talking about transplanting early. And then when, um, they were told about rack two, it was more like, Oh, because of the prematurity, we should wait. Um, 
to transplant you. So mom was under the impression she says that they weren't going to transplant her anytime soon. Um, but I've been talking to her. We've been talking about, to her about transplant um, from the beginning, um, which I, I know she conceptualized that it, it, this needed to be done, but I, it, I think she didn't really feel much of an urgency. And maybe that was also because her counts were so good. Um, but um, at this point, we've been talking about it a lot. Um, and so um, I just was hoping we could talk to some, or kind of engage in a discussion about transplant considerations with her weekly positive EVV PCR in infancy. Um, also on the slide that Ryan showed with some of her, uh, with her um, Invitae genetic mutations, she had a few different um, variants of unknown significance, one of which was for ACD, which is a dyscalculus congenita disease. So we also have done telomere length just because that would could impact her conditioning regimen. Um, and so I was hoping maybe we could engage in discussion of, you know, in this initially skid looking, less skid looking baby, but still quite significantly immunocompromised. How soon we should be transplanting her um, and what other things we should be thinking about. She doesn't have any siblings. She has two nine out of 10 donors with a, I can't remember exactly which mismatch, but the, it's not a, it's an unfavorable mismatch. Um, and I think one of them was older in the fifties maybe and the other one I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Any shared thoughts? So I think the transplant question is a really good one. You know, sometimes knowing a genetic diagnosis can really help you. Sometimes knowing a genetic diagnosis can hinder you in the sense that it makes you pause because you wonder, oh, so what do patients with RAC2 ultimately look like? And since the disorder is so rare, you know, it's it's really hard to judge. You know, the original patient by David Williams was really sort of um, LAD-ish, um, whereas more recently, Amy Sue at NIH, they've got an abstract that was presented somewhere with three patients. And a lot of those patients actually had really low T cells and B cells as well. You know, more, one of them, I think even may have even had absent trucks. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to sort of look at your patient globally, sometimes in the context of not thinking too hard about the genetic mutation and just thinking about your patient who overall is concerning even without knowing that. So knowing what your patient looks like and then knowing that you have this, you know, mutation in RAC2 that's pathologic, um, I'd say BMT is definitely worth considering even with a 9 out of 10 donor. What do other people think? It looks like there was a question from um, an audience member. Um, why are her lymphocyte counts rebounding and is she thriving? She is definitely thriving. She's doing great. Um, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. My um, internet yes, we can. me a red flag. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Kind of? Yes. Very well. Okay. Yes, yeah, she's thriving. She otherwise looks great. We got her. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, my my internet signal keeps going red. Um, the she's definitely thriving and doing well. Um, and she, we hooked her up in our NICU graduate clinic um, here, and she just underwent a swallow study because she was having a little bit of difficulty with feeds. She is making IgM antibodies. Yes. Someone just asked if she was making IgM antibodies, and she is. Um, actually, well, I mean. She, I don't have her latest ones here, but she definitely, um, all of her levels for IgA and IgM were increasing. Is there another question I missed? Yeah, the someone had asked um, uh, why the lymphocyte counts were rebounding. Um, yeah, so the question about what's the hurry from BMT, I guess that is an excellent question. Um, I think from our standpoint, 
Um, we know that she's at risk for having severe in, um, infections in infancy and more atypical infections. Her neutrophils aren't great. Um, and that's even a, an overstatement, I think. But she, it, her T cell numbers also aren't great. So I just worry that the infection risk is high. And I would definitely want to transplant her before she gets sick. Um, and so I think that's why we've started. But there is, I mean, I feel like, as I told mom, I said, this isn't emergent, but I think it's urgent. Um, but as we do that, we're trying to get her to keep growing um, and exploring the options with the different donors. I wonder about that new cohort of, um, of patients um, I'm not as familiar with. Um, I think uh, what made it hard on uh, as was previously mentioned, is that you know she uh, the previous descriptions they they all were um, transplanted um, quite early, and so that's kind of what we yeah. what I know about um, patients that have this have this identified mutation. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm not aware of other long term um, data. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think there's less than 10 patients reported. Um, the original case and then the Jackie paper, and then Amy's got her three patients. We've, I've never seen a patient with RAC2, but we diagnosed one patient through the lab. And that patient basically had severe bone marrow failure, you know, at birth and was picked up um, and was transplanted before three or four months of age. Um, so it, it's really hard in these super rare disorders to know what the right thing is. Because, you know, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, her lymphocytes are coming up. Maybe they're going to continue to improve. Um, her IgM is coming up. Maybe she'll continue to improve. But, you know, it, it's very difficult. And her neutrophil function is certainly going to remain poor. And so. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, it's, it's me, sorry. Thanks for weighing in. I, we're going to wrap up. So the other case has. Um, enough time, but I just want one question because it's something in my, maybe I've been struggling with um, personally. Um, but so, you know, um, I was wondering about the Bactrim prophylaxis because she's on it daily in the bone marrow suppression. And now that I know that her function is a little bit better from a T cell standpoint, could, would it be worth trying to just kind of do Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, to see if maybe that can help? increase her neutrophils and it's just so weird to me that like her neutrophils were completely normal and then like two weeks later we're like in the toilet um and so i don't know um if i was just trying to see if there's anything else i could do to help that part um, and i don't know what other people would do i think that's very reasonable you know you could also think about some periodic gcsf dosing um you could switch her back term off you could put her on something else for staph prophylaxis um you know, with a normal PHA and a T cell count of, I forget what it was, but if your T cell count is now, you know, seven, I don't know what your CD4 count was. It was like no, five, six hundred last check. 250. Say again. It's 250. Okay. So then you're still going to need your PJP profi. Yeah. So, but you could switch her to an alternative agent. You could put her on pentamidine and yeah. you could think about clindamycin for staph prophylaxis reasons. Um, and see if that helps. Okay. Or just some GCSF. I'd do a bone marrow first if you're going to think about some GCSF just to yeah. keep her okay. ANC above 500. Carl just pointed out that, you know, in general, um, in the HIV population, it is just Monday, Wednesday, Friday for PJP. Okay, sorry. Um, I want to make sure that the next great case also has enough time. Thank you guys all for um, listening to the interest, our interesting case and weighing in on management um, for this. All right, so we'll move on to the next case. I'm Elizabeth Fuel. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Wild Cornell. Um, I have Raquel Rosner, um, who's a resident in internal medicine at Wild Cornell. She's going to present. Um, and then our senior mentor um, and the primary provider for the patient um, uh, or attending provider is Charlotte Cunningham Rundles, whom we all know as a professor at Mount Sinai. Um, so Raquel, did you want to take over? Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so I will start it off. 
This is a case, episodic altered mental status in an adolescent with CD40 ligand deficiency. I'll start off by presenting the case, then reviewing CD40 ligand deficiency, discussing the differential diagnosis, treatment, and then we'll wrap up the case. So the case starts off, this is a 13-year-old male who has a past medical history of alpha thalassemia trait, CD40 ligand deficiency, chronic complex migraines, and he's presenting with his third episode of altered mental status since age 11. So I'm going to begin by uh, starting with his initial diagnosis. So at age four months old, he was admitted to Cornell for respiratory distress. Um, he already had multiple respiratory infections at that point. Um, and he was diagnosed with presumed PCP pneumonia based on symptoms and uh, bilateral opacities on chest X-ray that improved with Bactrim and IVIG. Uh, at that point, his brother was already diagnosed with CD40 ligand deficiency. Uh, his brother's a few years older. So this raised concern for CD40 ligand deficiency in this child as well. Uh, he was then formally diagnosed um, and he was started on uh, IVIG and Bactrim prophylaxis at the age of four months. He was doing well. He achieved uh, all developmental milestones. Um, he had about 10 sinus infections per year, requiring four to five antibiotic courses per year. Uh, the only complications uh, up until 2015 were uh, IVIG-related migraines and intermittent moderate neutropenia. Um, and then in August of 2015, he presented for his first episode of altered mental status. So he again presented to Cornell uh, with confusion, difficult following commands, eye fluttering movements, uh, fevers, and vomiting. Uh, they did a complete comprehensive infectious workup, including blood and urine cultures, uh, Lyme antibody, uh, serum PCR for routine infections, including HSV, EBV, CMV. He had a respiratory viral panel, uh, PCR, including atypicals, uh, cerebrospinal fluid studies, um, and an autoimmune encephalitis PCR sent as well. Unfortunately, they were all uh, unremarkable. Nothing grew. He then had an EEG uh, that showed generalized Flowing, um, and he had an MRI that showed global atrophy. Uh, at that point, uh, no diagnosis could be made, but they treated him empirically for Lyme disease. He continued to suffer from cognitive decline and memory loss. Uh, and uh, one year later, at age 12, he had another episode of altered mental status, this time uh, with slurred speech left-sided weakness and headaches. He was admitted to the ICU uh, due to unresponsiveness for an unknown amount of time in the setting of high fevers. He again underwent an infectious workup that was all unremarkable. This time CSF was sent for acid fast bacillus, fungi, uh, as well as the cryptococcal <laughs> antigen. And again, the viral encephalitis panel, all were negative. Um, he had a repeat EEG that did show a uh, new left hemispheric uh, epileptogenic potential consistent with seizure-like activity, uh, and then was started on Keppra, switched to Depakote due to uh, migraines that they thought Keppra was contributing to. Um, and he remained on the Depakote for about 18 months until June of 2017, he hadn't had any headaches or seizures, so uh, the neurologist following him decided to stop the Depakote. Um, between June and September, he started to have uh, an unintentional weight loss of about uh, 25 pounds since uh, January of 2016 up until August of 2017. He had a very poor appetite. Uh, he underwent uh, an endoscopy that showed reflux of esophagitis uh, colonoscopy that was unrevealing, uh, and all GI PCR studies were negative. He was uh, eventually diagnosed with lac uh, lactase deficiency and started on a lac lactose-free diet, uh, Miralax, and a proton pump inhibitor for this esophagitis. And so finally, that leads us to um, the case report. 
which is age 13. So age 13, this is his third episode at this point of altered mental status. Uh, he was in his usual state of health, uh, went to school that morning, ate lunch, came home, was doing homework, all of a sudden felt drooling in the right side of his mouth with slurred speech confusion and right-sided numbness, including his face. His parents uh, took a video to confirm this story and they drove him to the ER. Fortunately, within 45 minutes, all these symptoms um, were gone. Um, on review of systems, he endorsed constipation, weight loss, headache, and worsening cognitive decline, but no infectious symptoms, no cough, congestion, fevers, or rash could be appreciated. Medications he takes include um, Gamunex, Synthroid, Bactrim prophylaxis, uh, Depakote, and um, lactate as needed. Family history is uh, notable. There, he was in norm, normal birth weight and delivery, no history of consanguinity. Um, mom and dad not related. They're from Colombia. Uh, brother has CD4 ligand deficiency, as stated earlier. Mom is a carrier. Um, he's in seventh grade. He has a special classroom with 12 students to one teacher to one teacher's assistant. He has a nurse at school. PT and OT. Um, to his physical exam, I'll point out pertinence. He was very somnolent, agitated, but arousable, slow at articulate speech, moving all four extremities with normal strength, uh, and decreased uh, sensation on the right face with a wide base gait. So at this point, um, I'd like to just review the differential diagnosis in an adolescent coming in with these symptoms and uh, discuss how it's a bit different from one with CD40 ligand deficiency. So uh, first, first and foremost, we would be concerned for an infection such as meningoencephalitis, uh, also a complicated migraine, a seizure, or a TIA or stroke. Particularly in an adolescent with CD4 ligand deficiency, sometimes they, ha they exhibit these neurological changes that are of an unknown origin. Um, we know that's been previously reported. And about 13% of these patients will suffer from CNS infections, typically with enteroviruses, toxoplasmosis, strep streptococcus pneumoniae, JC virus, um, Mycobacterium and Cryptococcus, to name a few. Does anyone have any um, questions or anything to point out at this time? Otherwise, I'll just move on. Okay, uh, I'm going to just move on. Yes, he was had one born question. In the United. Yeah, I saw. <laughs> the question is: Was the child born in the United States? Yes, he was. He was born in the United States. He lives in um, Long Island in New York. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm just going to move on. Um, just discuss some of these common things and how they present. So a hemiplegic migraine is a form of an aura that involves unilateral weakness during attacks. Um, in between tacks, they have normal neurologic function and uh, normal imaging, but during severe cases, imaging may actually show cortical atrophy. So that's something concerning. Um, then encephalitis, which is another you know worrisome diagnosis, is just an inflammation of the brain. Um, and formally, the diagnosis is uh, altered mental status greater than 24 hours without an alternative explanation, and two or more of the following uh, fevers, seizures, focal neurologic deficits, greater than five white blood cells in the CSF, an EEG abnormality or abnormal uh, imaging findings. Um, I see there was a question. Should I take that now or should I wait? Um, I guess it looks like it's more of a comment. So 
um, Whipple's okay. um, and celiac sensitivity can cause some GI issues and ataxia. So mm -hmm. I guess something mm -hmm. else to consider in this patient. Okay. We can talk about that a bit later when we discuss the differential. So briefly, I'm going to just go review CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, so it is a rare uh, disease. The incidence in the United States is one in one million, and it's found in males. Um, it's a combined immunodeficiency disorder that is X-linked, caused by a mutation in the gene encoding CD40 ligand. And these patients are susceptible to bacterial, fungal, viral, and parasitic infections. And they also have an increased risk for malignancy and autoimmunity. Um, it was initially referred to as hyper IgM. Uh, by Rosen and Burton in 1961, and then later deemed CD40 ligand deficiency um, once, once the defect in that gene was discovered in 1993. Um, so this uh, CD40 ligand is expressed on activated CD4 and CD8 T cells, mast cells, B cells, um, to name a few, and it will bind to CD40, as you can see here on this dendritic cell, um, and it, CD40 is also found on other cells, including B cells, monocytes, um, and epithelial cells, to name a few. And we can kind of go through this PowerPoint. Um, you see here that we have an antigen presenting cell that interacts with the T helper cell. Um, and then the activated T helper cell expresses its CD40 ligand binding to a B cell, and that B cell is able to now differentiate into uh, memory B cells and, and different types of immunoglobulins. And I just want to point out that uh, the binding of CD40 ligand with CD40 um, is crucial for T cell activation as well as B cell um, differentiation, and that's why it's a combined immunodeficiency and not just a problem with B cells. Um, these patients cannot uh, have immunoglobulin class switching. They often don't have germinal cells in their lymphoid organs, and their T cells cannot be primed. The diagnosis typically involves an impaired vaccine response normal or elevated levels of IgM, low IgA, IgG, and IgE. Um, they, ha they have absent memory B cells, and as stated before, they have an impaired T cell proliferation to antigens. And usually the diagnosis does require a documented mutation in the CD40 ligand gene. So typical complications of this disorder do include infection within the first year of life. Um, many will already have recurrent opportunistic pulmonary infections by one year of age, and uh, many will present with PCP pneumonia, as did our patient, as the first presenting finding. Um, otherwise, sinusitis, chronic diarrhea, um, progressive neurodegeneration, as stated before, um, and important to mention, they are predisposed to sclerosing cholangitis, uh, and that can lead to biliary duct and liver cancers, and uh, this is associated with cryptococcal infection that these patients uh, are unfortunately very susceptible to. So the, the way we treat this disorder is with IVIG. Uh, of note, it does reduce the severity and frequency of infections, but it will not prevent cancers or any of these permanent um, complications from developing. Uh, PCP prophylaxis with Bactrim or Pentamidine is uh, usually indicated. Um, they can get GCSF or neutropenia. Hematopoietic uh, stem, stem cell transplant, I'll touch upon it soon, but there's really not uh, much conclusive data on it. Um, CD40 agonists and gene therapy are also controversial and investigational. The prognosis of this disease is uncertain as of today. Some do well, some don't. Um, it's unclear why. 
Uh, unfortunately, the majority of data we have is old and worrisome. Um, and this number, 25 years of the median overall survival is an old number quoted from 1997 paper. We don't have updated data at this point. So now let's get back to the case. Uh, I'll just go through briefly the labs. So he just showed a neutropenia. Um, all his infectious workup yet again was negative. He had all of these cultures and studies done, um, which I've already pretty much talked about before. So it's comprehensive. This is his infection profile at the time. So he had a high IgG reflective of his therapy that he was receiving every three weeks. He had a low IgA and a, a chronic neutropenia, but a normal peripheral um, lymphocyte count. He had another EEG that just showed left hemispheric flowing, um, and he had an MRI of the brain that showed stable, moderate, uh, generalized volume loss. And this is an actual picture of his brain. Um, you can see the atrophy. He was treated with Toradol uh, for his headache, um, which improved. He also continued to receive Bacchamon IVIG, and he was eventually adv advanced back to his lactose-free diet. But unfortunately, you know, the, the, the diagnosis that was made is inconclusive. It's not clear what exactly is going on. Um, at the top of the list at the time of discharge was hemiplegic migraine. Um, rather than seizure or stroke or any of these infections. Um, so that was, that was the leading theory at this point. Afterwards, uh, from discharge, he did go to see um, Dr. Cunningham Rundles at Mount Sinai. Um, he was still having a very poor appetite, abdominal pain, um, very, just a general poor quality of life for this child. Um, she saw him and thought uh, possibly he should get a brain biopsy to rule out uh, a low-grade infection that is difficult to detect. Um, he was actually sent to NIH for that to comment on if, if it would be useful in his case, since we still don't know what, what's really going on with him. So he then went to the NIH. Uh, he was initially evaluated inpatient. He still had a very low um, Wexler intelligence score with poor cognition. Um, his MR, he had an MRI there of the brain and spine, which were, uh, the, the brain was stable. The spine was unremarkable. He had another LP. Um, he had a CT of the chest that showed ground glass opacities, but no PCP. Um, he then went to the outpatient clinic, uh, again, just, just not, not doing great. Um, and they actually performed a deep sequencing PCR on his spinal fluid that showed anello virus. So anello virus uh, is, it's a group of single-stranded DNA viruses that are relatively new. Uh, they include these three common ones, TTV, TTMDV and TTMV. Uh, they're usually found in, uh, you know, humans, chimpanzees, pigs, cows, multiple animals, and pretty much near 100% of adults are infected worldwide with at least one of three subtypes. It can be associated with hepatitis, lung disease, lupus, blood disorders, but majority of cases are asymptomatic and it's transmitted usually fecal oral, maternal, child, or in respiratory secretions. Um, but interestingly, um, to Kip et al. Uh, in a 2012 paper um, noted that nearly 100% of children between the ages of two and 36 months old um, had evidence of the TTV and TTMBV DNA in their serum when they were admitted with fevers greater than 40 degrees Celsius. Um, compared to only 50% of children in that same cohort. Um, 
who had a fever up to 38 or 38.5. So it's possible that they thought fever could be allowing permission of viral replication of this Anello virus. Uh, it's still unclear though if it's causing any symptoms um, or any harm. So now we'll just talk about January 2019 and what we're thinking. And we're thinking um, it could be hemiplegic complex migraine. Um, it could be, you know, why is he having this encephalitis with intermittent inflammatory activity? And we're not so sure if the Sinella virus has any significance to his presentation. So at this time, I, I think that we should discuss. You know, I'd like to hear what everyone has to has to say about this unique this unique case and this interesting patient. Uh, yeah, thank you, Raquel. That was great. Um, um, I thought this case was illustrative in um, reminding us all of uh, potential complications of hemiplegic migraine, uh, but also just raises the question of you know, does an otherwise benign virus um, you know, should we be concerned that this virus is thought to be benign in a normal individual might be causing pathology in an immunodeficient patient, you know, with CD40 lag and deficiency? Um, and we have a question. Does he have progressive neurocognitive decline? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we also know that um, sort of uh, that neurocognitive decline of unclear etiology has been reported in CD40 lag and deficient patients. But that also, I think, raises the question, is there some unidentified infectious cause for this? Um, or is it just, you know, a non-infectious associated complication of CD40 lag and deficiency? So those are the sort of the interesting questions. Any other thoughts from the audience or Charlotte? Do you have um, do you have anything to add? Anything we missed? Well, from my standpoint, <clears throat> I met this child a long time ago, and since the age of eleven to his current age, he's had pro progressive neurologic decline. He now cannot go to school, aside from the parameters that Raquel mentioned. He needs a complete and continuous aid in school with him, which was not the case when he was 11 years old. So this is a rather rapid decline. I'm, I, I, I don't know why anybody would, you know, use the diagnosis of migraine for him. I think this is an encephalitis. Um, it is a low grade encephalitis and obviously it's extremely worrisome. The reason for trying to do the deep sequencing is exactly as Raquel said, we have seen it before in hyper IgM. We've I previously had a young man of 23 who had de brain decline after graduating from high school, and then over the next three years had complete and utter decline and ultimately died of it. Yeah. And for that reason, you know, I think one is always very determined to see whether it is an organism of one sort. Our problem now is: is this an Nello virus a cause, or is it simply in there for the ride? And I think the jury is out on that. It was done by Ian Lipkin. Um, he happens to be very good at this. Uh, whether or not it's causative or not, we don't know. We don't know if it's actually in the brain tissue. It's certainly in the spinal fluid, at least it was on that one day. There were a couple of questions flashed by. Yeah. Um, so um, are there any antivirals that work against the virus? Um, I, I'm not aware. Actually, uh, yeah, no. As far as I, as far as my review, there's no antivirals that exist because it's usually asymptomatic and doesn't cause, you know, pathologic disease. And then was was there sequencing done on the blood? Um, I don't believe so. I think it was only on the CSF. Um, is that correct? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting thought to check if other. CD40 lag and deficient boys um, have an allovirus uh, related to an encephalitis. That um, that would be yeah. That might I, be useful. I think it's so sufficiently rare. You know, I don't I don't know of any others currently at this time. But we all have heard of a few cases in which 
rare organisms have been found in our patients. And the only way to look for these is by deep sequencing of spinal fluid. And then there was a question, any thought on upping the IgG dosing? Well, he's got 1,600 as his trough levels. So that's pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. The other yeah. question is about transplant. So he's currently on consideration for transplant at, at, this, at this point at the NIH, just because I sent him there to get some additional thoughts and try to get the brain biopsy for free, to be honest. Um, and the transplant has been considered, but would that be safe in the presence of potential virus, number one? And number two, what would it do for his brain since his brain has already shrunk and encephalitic? Right. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I know we're getting to the end of the hour here. Um, are there any other questions or thoughts? Has the affected sibling had similar issues? No, the affected si the other guy is in college. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Raquel, thank you so much pre for presenting this challenging case, and Charlotte, thank you for um, sharing your patient and your knowledge, and for to everyone for listening in. Um, I hope everyone has a great evening. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>